Unlike missions that go into orbit around their target planet, New Horizons is traveling so fast there's no practical way to slow down. After a 10-year trip, closest approach to Pluto and Charon will flash by in less than a day. In addition to sophisticated instruments, New Horizons needs its mission operations team practiced and ready. So though in reality it's June 2005, here at the Applied Physics Lab it's already Encounter Day, July 2015. The ability to practice things in those years far out there are all part of the planning now to assure mission success then. It's a weekend, but the operations team is working on a highly realistic mission simulation of that critical 24-hour encounter period. Pluto is so far away that radio signals from Earth take four and a half hours to get there and four and a half hours back. So every aspect of the encounter, from navigation to operation of the science instruments, must be programmed ahead of time to the split second. Seven minutes ago. We're actually practicing an encounter sequence, a Pluto encounter sequence today, with the ALICE instrument, the RALPH instrument, REX, the radio science instrument, SWAP, one of the particles, and LORI, which is the high res imager. So we'll be looking at Pluto for a while, and we'll be looking at Charon, and we'll be looking back, so it's a kind of a flip flop type of thing. There are many years of planning that go into uh, each of these events that we that will execute when the spacecraft is in flight and, and that's what this test is all about is practicing that whole process and the software that's involved. And this is going to be incredibly nerve-wracking as we do the encounter we get one shot at flying by Pluto that's both terrifying you know also very exhilarating. If an instrument yeah, fails to turn on as planned, if a thruster burn starts a fraction of a second late, then the spacecraft will have lost its only opportunity to study Pluto up close. You know, someone may say, well, why are you doing an encounter test that doesn't happen for years? Why are you doing that on the ground? And the response is that we do not like to do any kind of flight software loads in flight because it's it's risky. So what we want to do is find out all the problems that we might have with that software on the ground. And the way to do that is to, to try to run through all the various activities that we're going to do in flight on the ground. Then what is different? This is what I think is different. Running the simulation in real time, without breaks, is meant to reveal problems with communications and with the computer displays that are the mission's lifeline to the distant spacecraft. So far it's going pretty good. Just some minor things we weren't expecting. Well, you can't anticipate all of the problems and some things that you never anticipated happening will happen during a, a mission simulation test. And of course this makes us better operators of the, the spacecraft because we've seen those problems taken care of them. We're about 10 minutes away. Almost 11,000 kilometers, which is what we've set up closest approach to be. Closest approach, and the computer triggers the infrared spectrometer that's part of Ralph. Right now we're scanning about the... So this is the LISA scan at 124 microradians? Yes, so you're scanning at negative 124 about okay. the body. One main purpose of the simulation is to translate all the lines of computer code into real-time, three-dimensional reality. And I've got the Z into the page. Okay. So minus Z is up. Mm -hmm. Oh, I know what we The rehearsal need. does its job. The pointing summary. They detect a potential right, so the problem. The cameras the aren't pointing where they should down. be to capture so key science data. And we missed Pluto. But it's only a sim, so no worries. So the sim was successful. It identified a bug that could be fixed before launch. So that's why we you know, have such thorough testing to catch that type of stuff. We expect to have little glitches here and there. This is the object of this practice run to work out all the ripples. And so when we do get ready to launch, we we'll just have smooth sailing all the way through. Three more mission simulations, plus the actual Jupiter flyby in 2007, would give them more opportunities to rehearse and practice. We also have to be sure that we have in-depth documentation so that we can understand what we did in 2004 in 2015. Many of the faces around New Horizons are relatively young. That also is no accident. 
you have to uh, have a longevity plan. And normally we're focused on instruments in the spacecraft surviving that duration and we don't get to Pluto till 2015. And for people we have to have a longevity plan. How old are you going to be? In 2015? Yeah. I don't know, something somewhere in my 40s. Oh, and you're a youngster. Yes. Come launch day and, you know, when we're doing everything with the spacecraft for the first time, that's where you get a real sense of reality. And no room for error then. Before they'll be ready to ship the spacecraft to Cape Canaveral, the hardware has to go through just as rigorous a test program. And for this mission, keeping on schedule is critical. But it's a special challenge whenever you do a planetary mission because the launch window is fixed. It's very, very important that we launch in either 2006 or 2007. We have to make that deadline. If you want to fly to Pluto on the quickest route, you need Jupiter in position. And that means we have to launch in January of 2006. It's also important that we get there as soon as possible because Pluto does have an atmosphere right now, but it's moving farther and farther away from the sun and at some point that atmosphere is going to freeze out. What we have left on New Horizons before we launch is to integrate the spacecraft and test it. When one builds a spacecraft, you build the individual boxes and instruments first, and they go through their own tests, both functionally and then environmental tests. And that's sort of equivalent to the members of an orchestra, each tuning up. But once you build it as a spacecraft, once you've assembled it, then you're playing the symphony. And that's what we've been doing. We've been testing it as a system. And then we test it again, and then we test it about five more times. And if we have surprises along the way as we're doing the work, we want to have time in our pocket to make up for those surprises. So we actually want to get the work done ahead of time. Our current list of tasks is in the tens of thousands. It feels a little bit like being strapped to a train going 500 miles an hour. Once we launch this, we can't go after with a screwdriver. We can't go fix anything that isn't working. We make sure that we carry plenty of spare equipment on board the spacecraft. If our main computer breaks, we have a backup. If our main transmitter breaks, we have a backup. And the test program, the full-up test program, is more than a year long. A big part of the testing that gives us confidence that it's going to work in flight is the environmental testing. So we put it into an environment that's pretty much exactly like it's going to see on its way to Pluto and at Pluto. That includes a thermal vacuum tank where we put it in this big tank, we pump all the air out, it's in a vacuum just in space, then we heat it up and we cool it down just as it's going to see when it's actually in flight. Another very tough thing for the spacecraft to endure is the launch itself. On these rockets, they're gigantic. They shake. They shake a lot. If you've ever seen a paint shaker at a hardware store where it mixes the colors into the paint. That's exactly what the spacecraft is going to go through during launch. And feels, in fact, that burnout of the third stage, I believe 13 Gs, so 13 times its own weight is what it's feeling. And that structure has to, has to support all of that. One of the things we do is we put the whole spacecraft on a gigantic vibration table, a paint shaker, and shake it. And, and then test it after that and shake it again and test it again. So that's what we're doing from now until launch. The test phases at the APL and Goddard have been very intense. Uh, we're running a seven day a week, three shift per day operation. Next, running the gauntlet of heavy traffic to Andrews Air Force Base for the flight to Cape Canaveral. From clean room to a cargo jet, Leaving home base, the mission managers were a little nervous. This is, this is definitely high on the stress level curve. Uh, getting the spacecraft moved from uh, you know, Columbia, Maryland, all the way down to the Cape is pretty tough. Like packing for a long trip, everything you need must come along. Test equipment, spares, tools. Uh, everything we're doing is the last time we do it. We want to make sure every bolt is exactly tight and fastened correctly. Everything's been assembled, tested, the records are kept properly because there's no going back. This is a flight build. At the Cape, it's going to get even more intense. But they almost didn't get this far. In 2000, plans for a mission to Pluto were in jeopardy due to budget pressures. A high school student, Ted Nichols, then 17 years old, helped keep the dream alive. You know, I just wanted to see us go there and see what we could learn about it. In 2000, with the Pluto mission in danger, 
he launched a website petition from his bedroom. Interest from press and public was fast and furious. It actually crashed my website at one point. I think I had so many signatures in the one file that it actually reset. So Reuters, the Associated Press, and all kinds of other press agencies. And then the next day, an article came out that the LA Times did about the efforts to save the Pluto mission and why it was so important to go there. At that time, we put together all the petition responses and uh, printed them out and bound them in a book. And all the petitions, not including the ones that were lost, came in a bound book about that many signatures. 